So purchase price was 216,000. I got it from a local realtor who knew me that he was thinking about buying it himself, but he backed out because the seller was very difficult to work. And I found that out during my transaction, a single, double, triple, whatever. But for me, a double means really 10% or higher. Uh, a 10% cash on cash return, I think that's a pretty healthy return. Uh, a triple for me, we're getting to about a 15%. A home run, we're getting to about a 20% at that point. A grand slam is 25%. And I've hit on about two or three of my deals, a 25% cash on cash return or greater. One of my properties I have in Maui, I actually got about a 40 or 50% cash on cash return. It was a pain in the butt. But when I toured the house, it was just a shithole, to be honest. Hi, everybody. Jose Luis Morales here. Welcome back to another episode of the Morales Group Show. Today, we have a very special guest. His name is Greg Cohen. He's been on a Bigger Pockets, featured on Bigger Pockets. And today, he is going to be talking to us about cash flow, real estate investing. There are different strategies as it relates to real estate investing. I think this is one of the most important ones, and this is the same one that I follow. So it's uh, exciting to have somebody else on the show that uh, believes in this. So he's going to be talking about cash flow, real estate investing, and he's even going to give us the formula on how to calculate cash on cash return. And then he is going to show us what he looks for when he's looking for cash flowing real estate. Welcome to the show, Greg. How are you? Jose, I'm doing well. I'm really excited to be on the show, and I hope this is going to be inspirational for other folks because I didn't really have a lot of this guidance starting out in real estate, so I hope some folks can find value in this conversation today. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent, man. So for our viewers that don't know who Greg is, who is Greg Cullen, and how did you get involved in this wonderful world of real estate investing? Yeah, so my name is Greg. Uh, I'm a Boston native. I moved down to Florida in 2004. I've lived across a lot of different places. I think mm -hmm. at an early age, I realized that I didn't want to be working for the man every day for the rest of my life. And I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, I think it was in the sixth grade. It was a very monumental time in my life. And growing up, I saw the power of real estate and I saw the loss of real estate when my parents lost their house. And so as I started working, I realized with my W-2 income, it was very, very nice to have. I made some great money, but I was always potentially at risk of potentially losing my job. So I started investing more and more of my money into long-term rentals and one short-term rental. And I was effectively able to replace my entire W-2 income all through real estate investing. So I'm a big proponent on making sure that people use real estate as a way to diversify their income or just as a way to replace your W-2 income overall. So you're not working for the man for the rest of your life. I love it. That's the same thing. So when I started off, Greg, I, I played a game called the rat race by Robert Kiyosaki. My broker had me play that game and it actually changed my life because it changed the way that I thought about real estate investing. Um, there's different formulas. Obviously some people speculate, they think that the market's going to go up. So they just buy a piece of property. I think that the way to be protected in the real estate market is if you buy properties that produce positive cash flow, that positive cash flow protects you during good times. It protects you during bad times. If the market drops 20, 30%, but you're still producing cash flow, it does not matter. So for our viewers that don't know uh, what cash flow investing real estate is, what is it and how do you determine if a property produces positive cash flow, maybe you can even go a little bit into cash on cash return. Sure. Yeah. So when I think of cash flowing properties, it's really at the, at the end of the day, you figure out what your property, what your total PITI is, your principal, interest, taxes, and insurance, figure out what that total amount is, get your market rate on those rents. And if you subtract the market rate minus your PITI, as long as you're a positive, boom, cash flow. That's cash flow investing by itself. Now it seems very simple. When I started out, I thought to myself, man, if I can get $100, $200 a door, this would be fantastic. And I'm thinking in the, the grand scheme of things, it's gonna take me 15, 20, 25 doors in, eight, in, eight, in order to hit my financial independence number. And it's just the wrong way of looking at it. It's nice at the beginning, but as you start getting a little bit more advanced, you start looking at just cash on cash returns. And when I think of cash on cash returns, it's your annual net cash flow from that property. So the rents minus your PITI, you have your monthly cash flow times 12 divided by the total amount of money put into the deal, the down payment, renovation, closing cost, whatever it could be. And ultimately at this stage, 
I'm looking for 15% cash on cash in any market. It doesn't matter where it's at. If it's anything less than that, it might not be worth it. And I might be wasting my time, but I'm always in the game of baseball. I'm shooting for doubles every which way. If it's a single, I'll still probably take it every once in a while, but doubles, those are consistently what get you over the line to be financially independent. When you say doubles, what does that mean? Does that mean double digit returns or what? Yeah, I, I just think in the in the game of baseball, it's it's easy to equate things if you're doing like a single, double, triple, whatever. But for me, a double means really ten percent or higher. Uh, a ten percent cash on cash return, I think that's a pretty healthy return. Uh, a triple for me, we're getting to about a fifteen percent. A home run, we're getting to about a twenty percent at that point. A grand slam is twenty five percent or more, and I've hit on about two or three of my deals, a 25% cash on cash return or greater. One of my properties I have in Maui, I actually got about a 40 or 50% cash on cash return. So it really varies. It's nice to have those big wins, but it's more exciting in the long haul to have those consistent doubles to get you over the line. Yeah. And even then, like I have so many clients, Greg, that come to me and they're like, oh, I'm making $500 positive cash flow. Uh, on my property. And I'm like, and most people would be like, oh, that's great. But the reality is that how much did you have to invest to get that $500 return? If they had to invest a million dollars and they're only making $500 and that's a very low cash on cash return. If they invested $20,000 $20, and they're making $500 and it becomes a much better cash on cash return. So I think that's really, really important by you bringing this, this up. Can you walk us through maybe an example of like a cash flowing property? And most people, if they get like a five, six, seven percent they're happy like how do you even find properties that produce 10 15 20 25 percent returns yeah my answer is probably not going to shock you whatsoever i'm looking directly on the mls i'm looking on zillow realtor.com i'm very familiar with the areas that i invest in so i can very quickly figure out what the median costs are and what might be sticking out for traditionally what i'm doing is finding places that are not in the best shape Maybe they've had a bad landlord. They've had lower rents. They have blue tarp roofs, green pools, holes punched in the wall. As soon as I walk into those places, I remember there was one duplex. I walked in and it's just a huge smell of just dog and dander. It was not great. But I walk in and I think to myself, there's opportunity left and right. Nobody wanted to buy this house because it smelled so bad. Uh, so I could go in there, take all the carpets out, repaint it. Boom. Just like that. It was perfect. But it's taking that long-term vision. It's understanding where those properties are at location-wise. That's one of the most important things. And then from there, figure out the, condi con the condition of that house and comparables in the area. If you renovate it the right way with the right contractors, if you're within your budget, use it very conservatively. But if it makes sense and if you can get that 20% return, even 10% return, it's worth, that, it's worth the gamble right now, especially with the economy going down the drain. you got to make sure your money's working for you. So can you give us an example of a property that you've bought that uh, maybe like some numbers like, hey, look, this is what I bought it for. This is how much we renovate it for. This is how much the comps were selling for at that time. Yep. Uh, this is how much market rent I was receiving at that time. This is how much I had to put down, et cetera. Definitely. A location yeah. as well, too. Yeah. So I have I'll tell you about my pool home outside Orlando, Florida. So I bought this in. I want to say it was 2019 or 2020. So purchase price was 216,000. I got it from a local realtor who knew me that he was thinking about buying it himself, but he backed out because the seller was very difficult to work with. And I found that out during my transaction. She was trying to renegotiate with me at times, trying to get out of the contract. It was a pain in the butt. But when I toured the house, it was just a shithole, to be honest. Like I, I actually didn't even see it myself. I had my parents FaceTime me and show me the house, but it had a blue tarp roof. It had a green pool. Um, there was holes in the tile. I don't even know how they did that. There was mold all in the countertops and the Formica countertops. It was by all accounts, pretty disgusting. And as soon as I walked in there, uh, virtually with my mom doing the FaceTime, I knew this was a great deal for me to go after. The comps in that neighborhood I was buying the house for 216. The comps were going for about maybe about 300, 320 in that range. I put about $60,000 into this house. I 
did everything. Brand new roof, new AC, uh, water heater, brand new floors in the entire house, qu uh, quartz countertops, stainless steel appliances, resurfaced the pool, paint inside, outside. Uh, the HOA loved me because this house was a sore spot in the entire neighborhood. And the neighbors, after I renovated this, they all appreciate that. And they started doing work to their own homes. So it had an exponential impact for the direct neighbors across from me. Ultimately, what I did was I did a burr on this and I was able to pull out $60,000 of my renovation money. So basically, I bought this house for 40, 50,000 with my 20% down payment. I put that 60 grand in for renovations. I burred the 60,000 back out and I redeployed and bought another house. Now, what this looked like on the rental side, I rented this out initially for about 2,200. I had another tenant in there afterwards on come renewal listed it for 2,800, got it filled. And my last tenant, I got it up to about 3,500 monthly. And this is one of the only pool homes in this suburb of Orlando. So I can list this and essentially name my price because there's no other pool homes. So effectively, when I bought this from that seller, she was listing it for $1,600 in rent. I was able to effectively double it just by fixing all of these things that she's deferred over time. How much positive cash flow is it making now? Like what's the monthly payment on it? The monthly payment on this one's about $1,400. So you're and making so like $2,000 a month, basically. Yeah, I'm making $2,000 passive. And the good news about this, and I know there might be some listeners thinking, well, how are you cash flowing this? You're not thinking about repairs and renovations. The beautiful side of this is I bought this place totally distressed and I was able to replace everything from the beginning because I really focused on making sure the tenant has a great experience, but also the tenant doesn't call me for miscellaneous issues. I want to get it all done in the first half, make sure it's all perfect, ready for them. That way, if an issue does come up, it might be something small, but I can just handle it at that point in time. So I'm really cash flowing $2,000 every single month. And even come vacancy, like when this uh, house comes up for renewal every April, I list this a couple months in advance. And traditionally for the past few years, I haven't even had one day of vacancy. I literally had the start date be, I think it's April 1 or May 1. Um, I'll have the cleaners come in April 1, and then I give the keys to the new tenant in the afternoon on that first. So literally having no vacancy, no real CapEx to worry about, and $2,000 passive in your pocket every month. It's, you can't get better than that. Yeah, so because you're renovating them, it basically almost makes it like a brand new property almost because exactly of all the extensive renovations that you've done up front. And that's one of the benefits of buying sometimes a property that is a fixer that you get to renovate it the way that you want. Now, for those viewers that don't know what a burr is, I know that uh, some people may be like, well, what is a burr? Why is he saying burr? Like, is he cold? Uh, what, what, is, what is a burr? Yeah, so burr is a great strategy using real estate. Uh, so it's buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and repeat. Uh, I don't think I'm missing any of the R's that come with it, but each <laughs> one of those play a very important part. So you're buying typically generally a distressed property. You want to renovate it, get it up to par. Don't over renovate it, get it up to what market rent should be and try to do it a little bit better than everyone else. Get it rented for top dollar, refinance out. And it's a little bit tough right now with these rates, but it's still possible to pull your cash out and then redeploy that and keep going from there. I love it. I love it. Okay, cool. And then um, as it relates to um, the cash flowing uh, real estate, like uh, what do you use to determine like market rents? Like how do you calculate the market rents? Obviously the PITI, you can either get a mortgage calculator or you can get your loan officer doing uh, help you with that. How do you determine what like market rents are and how do you determine if something is currently rented at market or what's the full potential for the market basically for that type of property? It's a good question. So when I'm thinking about market rates where I'm finding this, I put myself in the shoes of potential tenants. So I'm going to be looking on Zillow, Realtor.com, uh, Apartment Hopper, I think it's one of the websites or apartments.com, whatever it's going to be. I want to see what these comps go for myself. So in the suburbs of Orlando, I have a lot of three twos. I'm going to run my three twos, similar square footage in that zip code. And I want to see generally what the low to high end is. They're going to be different conditions. Some might have stainless steel appliances. Some might have a nice pool, whatever it could be. But I really try to pinpoint exactly where I'm in line with that. If I want to go one step further, there's a website called rentometer.com. 
and I can type in my address for where I'm looking at, and it can give me a range, really a gauge of saying, am I charging too much or too little? Starting out, I would always try to be about, about $50 to $100 less than the market rate because I wanted to have a high amount of renters coming in. Now, with some of my properties, some of these specialty ones, think of that pool home in the suburbs of Orlando, I can essentially name my price. Um, most of the three twos there go for now 3,200, you know, 3,000, 3,200 in that range. There's no pool homes. Having a pool in your backyard is a huge luxury, especially in Florida. So I can rent this easily for 3,500, 3,700, whatever it's gonna be, and I'll have a wait list to get into that. But at the end of the day, going back to your question, put myself in the shoes of potential tenants. Look on where the sources that they are looking themselves, Zillow, Realtor.com, and then just try to do a, a gut check. What makes the most sense for your property? I love it. I love it. Good, man. And then um, how do you determine the area? I know that you uh, off camera, you mentioned to me that you've bought in Orlando. I think you bought in Austin. You own some in Maui. Like, wh what is that process like? Like, does this strategy of buying cash flow, investing properties work better in some areas versus other areas? Or is it kind of like the 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 just anywhere like Southern California would work as well too? I mean, I think it can work in any market, but I think there's a lot of variables to consider. So we're thinking about, say, population growth, where people are trying to move to the most, uh, the biggest influx of places. Lately, it's been Orlando from Florida in general. There are a lot of people moving to Austin during COVID. Uh, Maui's a great place to be visiting too. So it's all around good stuff to consider. I would also consider some of the states that people might be investing in. Are they landlord friendly or are they more tenant friendly? So I think of in Florida, I had a problematic tenant last year. And for me, I had to get this tenant out of the house. End to end, it took me about 16 days from the start of the eviction process to the very end. I tried to make it work amicably, didn't work. Try that same thing in California, Portland, New York, any of those places, it's gonna be very difficult and it's gonna get dragged on for maybe three to six months. So I think there's some, uh, some thoughts around that too. What's gonna be the easiest to work with when shit inevitably goes wrong? Um, but I'm primarily looking at population growth, commercial growth. I'm thinking five, 10 years from now where people potentially want to be, uh, and really where has the places that have the strongest rental growth too. You can easily invest in the Midwest. Uh, those are great rental markets too. And they're landlord friendly states, some of them. Uh, but the problem is they don't always have the highest appreciation with it too. Now, some investors, when they're looking, they'll invest for cash flow and that appreciation, I mean, could be icing on the cake or some folks are the opposite way. They're investing for appreciation like a lot of folks in Austin have historically, and they hope to cash flow in two to five years when rents catch up. I think that is the complete wrong thing to do. It's always invest for cash flow and appreciation is the icing on the cake. And in places like Orlando, Austin, Maui, uh, Georgia, those are all great places to be doing this too. I love it. And now, are there any rules of thumb? Like I know I had a rule of thumb, like if somebody were to say, hey, I've got a deal for you, I had a rule of thumb that I would use to be able to analyze a deal in less than like 20 seconds or 30 seconds. Is there any like rules of thumbs that you use if let's say I bring you a deal and I say, hey, I've got this great property at 500,000, like it's a single family home. What are the questions that you're gonna ask to determine whether yeah. or not it's gonna cash flow? Fast. In term, yeah, it's if somebody brings me a deal, I'll usually at that point have vetted them out a few times before to figure out if they know what they're doing or if they're trying to just kind of slowly start getting the game. You can always use that one or two percent rule. I know Bigger Pockets is a huge fan of that, and that's a great way of doing it. It gets a little bit complicated now with interest rates. So typically, if somebody brings a deal my way, I'll take it. I'll go a little bit faster or a little bit longer with the whole process. I'm going to go on Zillow. I'm going to figure out what my PITI is on a property like this. From there, I'll just quickly look at market rates or even rentometer. You could probably do all of this within 30 seconds, maybe a minute. And you can use that as a pretty healthy gauge of saying, can I actually make some money on this? One, is it going to cash flow? And two, am I going to get at least a 10% cash and cash return from this? Because in this market right now, there's a lot of people who are just trying to throw money at the market and just hope it, hope it sticks and hope people grow into it. But the right thing to do is invest for cash flow, swing for those doubles, and make sure you're consistent with it too. 
Now, for those viewers that don't know what like the one percent rule is, uh, would you happen to be able to share that? If not, that was the rule that I was kind of talking about. Yeah. Um, and that was like I I used to attend like real estate uh, coaching events. And I had agents that found out I was buying real estate and they would be like, oh, I've got this great deal. And I'd say, okay, how much is it for sale and how much could I rent for? And then I'd do the math on the 1% roll. And if it would match that, then I'd be like, okay, tell me more. I'd be like, I'm not interested right away. And I would be able to like, without even running any comps or anything like that, I would just be able to do it. Unless, uh, And if they said the rent is X, I'd be like, okay, is that market rent or is that what it's rented for right now? Because like you said, sometimes rents are not where the marketplace is. And if they're not where the marketplace is, then obviously it may still match that 1% rule. So what what's the 1% for sure. rule for the viewers that don't know what that is? Yeah. The 1% rule is you're basically using 1% of that sales price. And if the rents are on par with that or greater, it's generally a good deal. Um, and that historically has worked in the past. Um, the problem is that 1% rule nowadays is very difficult to come across. If you think about 2022, there's a lot of inflated purchase prices that come with it. And those prices have still sat where they're at. It really hasn't hit the sellers at this point. People are starting to realize it and come down on their price. But the 1% rule is a little bit tricky in this economic climate. You can potentially do the 1% rule. The duplex that I closed on in November in Florida, I bought it for three ninety. I have it currently listed. Both sides are rented for about forty two hundred combined, so it exceeds that number. But pull, like pulling the onion back a little bit, I did have to invest in that property. I had to replace uh, some of the flooring one unit, replace the appliances in one unit. So while the one percent rule can work as a leading indicator, it's always important to take a step back and figure out you know, what those rents look like today, what type of conditions the property looks like, uh, purchase prices in relation to just comps in general, like all of that stuff is important once you have that 1% rule down. I love it. Cool. Now, in order, whenever you're calculating cash flow or calculating cash on cash return, are you doing this on a piece of paper? Are you going on Zillow to calculate the PITI? Do you have a calculator that you use? What, what is the process there? Yeah, for me, I like to make my life difficult. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. So I'll go on Zillow, I'll go on the calculator, I'll figure out what that PITI is. And then from there, figure out what market rents, rents are on maybe Zillow itself, realtor.com. And literally I can just pull the calculator on my phone or on my computer and then just do it from there manually. Um, there's definitely more efficient ways of doing this. I know some folks have calculators that they've built, which are very important to use. It could be for renovations or including vacancy costs or future capex those are pretty important especially as you're starting out for me at this age i've realized what good looks like what bad looks like and i've done enough re major renovations that i'm pretty confident within a few small margin points of where something will eventually fall um one of the last ones i did i did it kind of on backhand uh napkin math and i think i was going to get like a 15 percent cash and cash return and at the end of the day, after I settled the books, did the renovation, got the tenants in there, I hit about a 17.5% cash on cash return. So the estimate worked out well, and I still exceeded that. So it's nice to kind of be conservative and be a little bit uh, consistent with it throughout the whole process too. I love it. Now, um, so maybe uh, other investors aren't renovating the property as much as you are. Like if they wanted to use like vacancy factor, um, what would be, I know obviously this is going to depend on the market um, or even maintenance expenses. Uh, what what are some of the different formulas or numbers that people can use? And then also like uh, some people may not know what CapEx is. I know that if you had asked me, what cap X is maybe like four years ago. Um, I wouldn't have known just because that was a term I had never heard. And I was mainly in the residential game. Uh, what is cap X? And then also like any rules of thumbs as it relates to vacancies or, um, or uh, maintenance expenses. For sure. So cap X that's capital expenditures. So think of capital improvements. These can be a brand new roof. It could be a new AC unit a new water heater, new flooring, paint, whatever it could be. Uh, these are generally things that are done one time that are depreciated over, could be five years. It could be 27.5 if you're including the house itself. Um, it could be a lot of different things, but generally it's 
you investing to replace something within that house itself. It's different than something like OPEX, operational expenses, which would be like getting your lawn cut or might be having pool service done, things that are continually done on a monthly basis. So having a heavier CapEx at the front can be a little bit scary for folks. It's a lot of money to renovate everything like what I'm doing, but if you can make the numbers work at the beginning, it can work out in its right way. Um, and I think your second question was around how can you really estimate some of these numbers, whether it's vacancy, whether it's uh, additional repairs, whatever it can be. I think a lot of people just use 8%, pretty standard for vacancy costs. Um, it depends on the folks. It depends on how well you run the business and if you're running it yourself. I think 8% sounds pretty fair, um, at least when you're running things. I'm going to be completely honest. I average my vacancy is across the board, probably 2% or less. So when I'm, when I'm actually running my numbers, I don't include vacancy because I have it set up in my contracts. I need to know at least 60 days before these leases end, if the tenant's going to renew. And if they tell me no in writing, I'm listing it that day. I'm getting a wait list for the future. So I'm really good at having that tight ship to reduce vacancy costs and come repairs. There are some rules of thumb. Um, I think some rule, one of the rules is, uh, use 50% of your gross rents each month, put that aside for potential issues that can go wrong. To be frank, I don't really do that when I'm doing all these capital expenses at the front end that takes care of a majority of it. Now issues do come up every now and then, for instance, I had one of my duplexes where I had to get the septic flushed. Um, there was a little septic issue there it cost me about four or 500 bucks and on a property that's cash flowing 2,500 bucks a month. Yes, I should have forecasted that, but I can forecast 60 or hundred dollars a month. It's just tough to assume like what things can go wrong or will go wrong too. I love it. Good. Now I wanted to ask you, um, some people factor in on their cash on cash returns. Sometimes they factor in principal pay down. Is that something that you ever factor in? And that was one of the things that like, I don't even think I noticed at the beginning, like when I started investing in real estate, it was all like, okay, how much positive cash flow does it produce? But then I started to realize that a lot of my principal balance, like two years, three years, four years, five years down the line, I'm like, oh man, that's gone down substantially. And I never actually factored it in. I think had I factored it in, maybe I would have pulled the trigger on a couple of additional deals as well too, that maybe I didn't really see a benefit to it. Um, do you calculate principal pay down at all or any tax benefits as well too? And um, It's a good question. Uh, so my short answer or long answer, short, no, uh, long answer to long. It depends on how investors want to be looking at things. I look at it as cash on cash. That's just money in my pocket, basically day one or year one. And then if it's hitting a 10% or higher, everything else will fall in place. You could also look at internal rate of return IRR that will take in consideration things like depreciation or depreciation, equity pay down, whatever it could be. I think of all of those things. Appreciation is probably the, the icing on the cake, but principal pay down, I just don't even consider it. I'm just thinking of purely cash flow. Does it make sense and does it make money in my pocket? If it doesn't, it's not worth my time. I love it. Now, where did you learn about all this? Maybe tell people a back about your background. Like, do you come from like a real estate background, like where everybody in your family is like a multi millionaire and owns a bunch of real estate? Or like, uh, how did you start learning about real estate investing and why the cash flowing real estate? Because I, until I played that game, I wasn't clear as to what my investment strategy was. Once I played the game, I was like, this is the strategy that I want to move forward with because this is going to protect me during good times and it's going to protect me during bad times as well too. Yeah. And so both good questions. So I'll say getting started in real estate, my family, we're not... Uh, we're not real estate investors by nature. I didn't grow up around uh, investors, anything like that. But at the age of, let's see, probably, I don't know what the age it was, 2008, 2009, in that time frame, we had a beautiful house at that point. We were overlooking the lake. We had a beautiful pool. Uh, we ended up losing the house because we were so underwater on that as a family. It didn't make sense for us to keep it. And so that happened for me at a very critical age. And I realized, I will never let this happen to me or my family ever again. At that same point in middle school and high school, my parents owned a rental out in the burbs, burbs of Orlando. And I realized some of the things that they did wrong. 
they didn't screen properly when they were working with some of these tenants. Um, they didn't hold security deposits as they should have. Some tenants damaged the places. It was just, it was a mess. And I was the one who was cleaning up that mess sometimes on the weekends. I'd be going and literally cleaning shit off the walls. Like it wasn't a fun experience, but I got to see the downside of real estate if it's not done correctly. And so fast forward a couple of years, I started working my W2 job. I work in sales and I started listening to bigger pockets often, all the time. I didn't even know they had a forum. I didn't know that even they had books. I just listened to the podcast on the way to work. I was driving an hour to work, an hour from work, and I could burn through one or two episodes a day, something like that. And I just picked up so much information from that. I didn't have any mentors, but I had this podcast where I can hear all these different experiences of what worked for people and what didn't work for people. And for me, that was just such an awesome experience to kill the time. I could have been listening to true crime stories, or I could have been listening to like Led Zeppelin or anything like that. But having that opportunity to invest in myself while driving was a great experience. And like you, you play the game, uh, I think it's Rhett Raised by Robert Kiyosaki. I played Monopoly growing up. So I learned very early on with Monopoly. And a lot of these games, I, I was a very sore loser where I'd have somebody like my brother who was very slick and he would do all these like nice moves and trades. And then there were many games that just ended with like me flipping the board over and be like, this game sucks. And once I took a step back and realized, you know, buy this real estate, you can build the hotels on it, you get more money in your pocket. I think even at that young age, it was so impactful to realize what could be possible with real estate and using this as an asset class. I have other folks, other friends who buy plenty of Ethereum stocks, whatever it could be. Some of them have literally 10 X the money that they have doing some of this, but my brain doesn't really understand crypto. I can take the time to learn real estate or to, to learn stocks, but I can't leverage my money like I can with real estate. And I think that's so powerful to use in this market too. I, I agree a hundred percent. Now um, for the people, like I read in your bio, something about a Chick-fil-A rule. I have no idea what that is. When I think Chick-fil-A, I think nuggets. I think the Chick-fil-A sauce. I think that juicy ham, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so what, what is the Chick-fil-A rule? Yeah. So I think it's for me pretty easy. So it's, it's leveraging other people's experience to invest around those areas. So I'll give the example of this, the suburbs of Orlando that I invested in. So mm -hmm. when I first, when I was living there myself, we had one Chick-fil-A in town and it was at the epicenter. Everybody was going there every single day. It was incredible. And it felt like communities were getting built kind of around that. And it really felt like that center of town. Now, mm -hmm. in the past few years, that same town has gone from having one Chick-fil-A to maybe about three or four Chick-fil-A's. Wow. So it's really blown up quite a bit. And so having that commercial development go there means that there's plenty of population moving there as well. And so it made sense for me. They have their own real estate team. They do all this research. They're doing research on traffic in town, people coming in, people going out, literally people who drive there, people who own rent, whatever it could be. They're figuring out people's incomes, demographics. And if it makes sense for Chick-fil-A, it probably makes sense for me. Now, other folks use different things. I mean, uh, Rob Abasolo from Bigger Pockets, I was chatting with him. So he uses the Whole Foods rule. If there's a Whole Foods, that's a great area to look at. For him as well, like if there's a Chipotle, great for his Airbnbs. Like he wants to be near Chipotles for the Airbnbs, it makes sense. Other people have different rules uh, and they can be as obscure as my Chick-fil-A rule. Like even McDonald's, they have their own real estate team. It's all in what matters to you uh, and your investing experience. Like the difference between me and Rob, completely different, different brands for different companies. We're probably hitting the same result at the end of the day and both have real estate teams. It's just about what makes the most sense for you. Yeah, and I think that's all it is. There's so many different ways to invest in real estate. For me, the reason I felt the most comfortable with cash flowing real estate is I wanted to be protected in case there was ever a market fluctuation. Uh, I know clients that buy based on speculation. And as soon as the market starts going down a little bit, boom, they're selling the property. And for me, I've been able to make some really good decisions, always just calculating what is my P my, what is my principal interest taxes and insurance? How much could I rent this out for? Cause that really is like worst case scenario for me. Like, uh, or there's obviously a lot of other worst case scenarios. So all this sounds great, Greg, like, man, what are some of the challenges though? Like, let's talk about yeah. like, 
all of this sounds like great. Like we're looking at you. We're just like, man, this guy is so smart. What are some of the things that haven't gone right? And what are some of the challenges that people could face if looking to, to do something similar? Yeah. I mean, there's challenges that come every which way. I think there's challenges as it relates to when you're running renovations on properties, it could be, um, they might go over budget. They might go over time potentially as well. Those are some risks that I have even still to this day, pretty often. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is partnership deals. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. I had one that didn't work out too well. I've had, and he's a great person. I, there's nothing bad I, can, I, I have against him, uh, but it just didn't work out. And it wasn't, you know, I can't say more than that. It just, it wasn't a good long-term fit. I have another partner who I'll be doing deals with him for the rest of my life, potentially. Uh, so there's just different things to consider. And the inevitable thing that could uh, go wrong. So I'm trying to think. So like my, my Maui condo that I use for Airbnb, uh, this one itself, things were going very well in that first month or two. Now, what I didn't realize was the house itself, uh, the condo, it had copper pipes. And so during COVID, not many people were traveling there. So when people were eventually coming back and flushing the toilet quite a bit, those copper pipes got completely dried out. And then with all the toilets that were flushing, they quickly expanded and the water started coming out of it as well. So at the end of the day, we had a water main break in our unit. And so you don't expect that ever to happen when you have a tenant who's a guest who's walking and treading in water, but what can you do from there? And so you can't foresee that happening, but that's why you have insurance and insurance saved us. I mean, we had a $50,000 renovation from that itself. Wow. So that was unexpected. So when you say insurance saved you, what does that mean? Like what type of insurance uh, are you getting on some of these properties and why was it able to cover you versus maybe somebody else? Yeah. So the insurance itself, it was able to cover me pretty well. I mean, I have all these properties insured in my name specifically. This just allowed me at the end of the day to make sure every single property is taken care of. I make sure it has the right coverages for everything, whether it's property, possessions, rental loss. What helped me in this one property itself that not many people think about, especially for whether it's short term or long term, is the rental loss coverage. We had a rental loss coverage of about $15,000 on this property. You don't really think about that when you're getting a policy. You don't think about when shit inevitably goes wrong, what you can do about that. Um, but when shit went wrong, um, we got a $15,000 paycheck or $15,000 check sent to us cashed because we couldn't use the property. And that was incredible that that sustained us for a couple months when we had to keep making these payments. That was truly helpful. On top of that, we also got the insurance for just the property damages itself. And that was another, I think 30 or $40,000, something like that. And that helped when the time came too. but. Not many people think about insurance till it's too late. I'm not a big insurance advocate by any means. Uh, I'm not trying to sell insurance, anything like that. But for your properties, I think it's a very worthwhile expense. Plus, it's a total write-off for you as well. That's awesome. Great. Anything else that you feel would be helpful, Greg, as it relates to cash flowing real estate investing, as it relates to cash on cash return that you feel would be helpful for our guests? I would just say... People get so entrenched in the details early on. They will get into something called analysis uh, analysis paralysis. Uh, you know, I had to think about it for a second because it's, I've spent too many times looking at properties and it's been a pain in my butt. Um, people get so stuck in looking at these details. They're trying to figure out what could work, uh, but most of the time it's what could go wrong. Um, I would just challenge the viewers listening to this of saying, Take that chance. If you run your numbers consistently and conservatively, if you can hit that double in the game of real estate, embrace it. There's going to be mistakes that happen. That's okay. Just embrace it because what's going to happen is if you've already run the numbers, if you can get a 10 or 15% cash on cash return, which you very well can do in this market today, even with interest rates like what we have, if shit goes wrong, you can always try to sell the place. If it's you're probably gonna buy a place that's maybe under market value, maybe have lower rents, lower purchase price, whatever it could be. Mistakes will happen. Just think about this over a 20 to 30 year span and just take it easy. Don't look at a six or 12 month span. We're thinking long-term what this can do for you, 
your kids, your grandkids, so on and so forth. I love it. I love it. You know, it's funny when you say analysis paralysis, when I asked you about the calculator, that's the same thing that I was thinking of as to how simple your process was. And I, and I have a feeling that for a lot of people, they get all these fancy calculators, they get like so involved in like running all these different scenarios. But sometimes what that ends up leading is to analysis paralysis. When I started investing in real estate, my formula for cash on cash return was very similar to yours. It was just like, hey, how much can I invest? How much can I get out? I think had I had all these fancy calculators, I wouldn't have done the amount of deals that I did because I would have been factoring in maintenance or I would have been factoring yep. in like uh, vacancy factors and maybe the cash flow wouldn't have seemed as great. But the fact that I didn't, I, I was I, I made the leap and I and I actually did it. So I think uh, a lot of people were trying to come up with these fancy calculators, analysis paralysis. Some people are trying to time the market, like thinking that they're smarter than other people and thinking that they they know something that everybody else doesn't know. Best thing is just get started with the first one. You know, once you get the first one, once the first one works out, it's easier to do the second, then it's easier to do the third and then the fourth. And then you end up like Greg, who's in a position where you can like be retired if you wanted to. Um, or you have enough financial freedom to be able to do whatever you want. So, Greg, if somebody liked this interview and somebody wanted to get a hold of you or somebody wanted to connect with you, what is the best way for de them to do that? Yeah, great question. I'm slowly starting my own social media presence. So it, it's taken time. So anyone who's listening, you can find me on Leveraged Hustle on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, all of that. Uh, Leveraged Hustle, one word. I will just say, like I mentioned before, I'm getting started in social media, so more content will be coming soon, uh, but I'm really excited to be kind of expanding some of the insights I have with others and sharing some of those best practices and lessons learned. I love it. All right. So for our viewers out there, uh, today we had Greg Cullen. He talked about cash flow, real estate investing. He explained to us cash flow or cash on cash return. And then he also explained to us how to buy investment properties that produce positive cash flow. If you have enjoyed this episode, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you feel that this episode would be valuable with a friend, family, or neighbor, make sure to hit that sharp button. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate your time. And uh, for our viewers out there, until next time.